Tom Snacks and Water in the back. Uh, but I just wanted to welcome you the, to the second part of today's day of collective action. My name is Samantha Eldridge. I'm the director of the American Indian Resource Center and University of Utah Tribal Liaison. Dr. Gasman really provided um, a wonderful overview of the history of HBCUs. And this panel really transitions us into how does that translate into the student experience. And we have a wonderful panel. And for those of you who may not be familiar with everyone, I'm going to do and read through a, an abbreviated um, bio. So if you can all just be patient with me. Well, I read through and introduce our panelists. Dr. Tiffany Baffer has over 25 years of experience in teaching curriculum development, social work practice, advocacy, research, and administrative leadership in social work and organizational development. At the University of Utah, Dr. Baffer serves as the Graduate School's Associate Dean for Graduate Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion while advancing her research agenda in the areas of anti-racist and inclusive pedagogy, violence prevention, and mental health, health disparities, and community-based participatory research. Dr. Karen Francis Begay is Diné and is of the Tabaha clan, born for the Kiani clan. She recently completed her PhD in higher education at the University of Arizona. Her dissertation title is between virtual roles and sovereign roles, tribal advisors in historically white institutions. Dr. Karen Francis Breguet has held several executive leadership roles at the University of Arizona, with the most recent being the assistant vice provost for Native American initiatives and prior being the assistant vice president for tribal relations. She also just shared that she recently re re retired and is a consultant. Uh, Dr. Brian Hubain um, hails from the beautiful Helen of the West Indies, St. Lucia. Dr. Hubain is the Associate Vice President for Student Development and Inclusion within the Division of Student Affairs here at the University of Utah. He previously served as one of the U Indian Tribal Liaisons between the University and the U Indian Tribe. Dr. Hubain holds an Associate Degree in Mechanical Engineering a bachelor's degree from Coppin State University in mathematics with a minor in computer science, a master's degree from Florida International University in higher education administration with an emphasis on international education and a PhD from the University of Denver in higher education with a focus on diversity and higher learning. Wow, that was a lot, Dr. Bain. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dr. Gerald T. Johnson is an assistant professor, higher education in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy. Further, Dr. Johnson is a scholar practitioner whose scholarship and educational practice is guided by critical identity, higher education leadership, and organizational change theories. Namely, Dr. Johnson's research examines how administrators at HBCUs work to promote the inclusion of LGBTQ students. Lastly, Dr. Brandon Johnson is a Senior Associate Dean for Student Success and Transformative Experiences in the Office of Undergraduate Studies at the University of Utah. In his program for undergraduate studies and other university-wide initiatives, units within Dr. Johnson's portfolio include the University Learning Center, a first-year academic learning community, student success coaching, the Center for First Generation Success, including TRIO, student support services, and upward bound programs first year programs and emerging role student success initiatives. Uh, please welcome our panelists. So just to begin, um, if we can just go down and please include any other brief introductory remarks that I did not include and share a little bit more about your connection with an HBCU or TCU. And I will begin with Dr. Beffer. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I am a, a graduate, it says so on this table over here, of Howard University, um, PhD, uh, 2003. Um, I'm also a second generation PhD grad of, of Howard University. Um, my mother also graduated from Howard, um, and my daughter is a first year student at Howard University. 
Um, most of my family members are also graduates of, of HBCUs. Um, my father went to Tennessee State um, University in uh, Nashville. Um, and it, it's just like a legacy. It's, it's just an incredible legacy. And I, I really um, resonated with the keynote today and the discussion about family. And I think that's something as an HBCU grad that I've tried to um, really bring to part of the vision of um, my work here as a researcher, as a professor, as an administrator is that sense of family and community um, that is, I think, such a precious part of um, being at a historically black college. Um, I'd also like to mention that um, I did attend undergraduate at an MSI at um, a, a um, Hispanic serving institution, um, New Jersey City University, which is in Jersey City, New Jersey, right outside of um, New York City as well. Um, and I have a master's degree from a um, women's college. So um, I've had a really, really very diverse experience um, in terms of my education. And I've also uh, worked at several historically black universities. Um, I came to the University of Utah from North Carolina A&T State University. And I've also worked at Winston-Salem State University for six years. Good afternoon, uh, Yat A. I'm Karen Francis Begay. Uh, real pleasure to be here with you this afternoon. So I traveled from Arizona, um, just really delighted to be here on traditional homelands of the Ute and the other um, different tribes that uh, make up the state of Utah. Um, my affiliation with tribal colleges and universities is um, pretty diverse, but I will say that um, I have not worked within a tribal college setting. Um, what brings me here is really um, probably the most recent uh, co-authored chapter that I did with Dr. Mary Jo Tippeconic Fox, who is Comanche um, faculty in our American Indian Studies Department, in a recent NASPA Student Affairs um, Practitioner Handbook um, that go comes out, I believe, maybe annually or twice a year. And we were invited to write a chapter on tribal colleges and universities. Um, it's one way for us to bring visibility to the significance of tribal colleges, which there are 37 across the United States. I'm from the state of Arizona that has 22 federally recognized tribes, but also has three distinct tribal colleges um, and universities. And so part of the work that I, I bring here and the knowledge is obviously the overall impact um, that we all have in having um, really a commitment and responsibility to supporting all students who are basically from underrepresented communities, um, but also where our tribal colleges are situated, which is really rural parts of, of, our, of our country. Um, also, our university, that, the university that I represent, University of Arizona, has done many partnerships with tribal colleges and universities, which I'll talk about um, in a little bit. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for being here. Um, happy day of collective action. Um, so I, you know, I, I wanna just echo um, this idea of, of coming into a legacy, um, you know, being part of a historically black college university. Um, Coppin, I went to Coppin State University and um, that's in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, and, you're right? <laughs> and, you know, um, Coppin was actually um, started off as a teacher's college, um, and it really cemented itself um, being, you know, an institution that was dedicated to the community. Um, and I would say this sense of family, this sense of community that I received from my HBCU um, started off as soon as I got on campus, um, and I was a student athlete. Um, I remember a landing um, in Baltimore, Maryland, and um, the next day was classes. Uh, so that was a very interesting experience. Um, but the, the fact that I didn't have a room, I didn't have a bed, um, but I still got a place to sleep. Um, the guys on the track team, they made sure that I had breakfast. 
they made sure to um, give me a tour of campus. Um, all of which I think so many folks would have gotten in other aspects of their university experience, but I got it from my teammates. Um, I would say, you know, it, going to Coppin State was very integral to my black identity, um, and it still carries me through today. Um, coming from the Caribbean, that's a very different black identity experience, um, and to have another side to that um, really, I would say, enriched my life and enriched the way that I carry out this work. Um, one thing that I would say it has even forced me to do, um, recently awarded a Spencer Foundation grant for 50000 <laughs> <laughs> to look at anti-blackness in student affairs, um, which is still very much needed um, because, you know, I, I think one of the things that we always um, come into contact with is this culture of niceness. Um, and so I would say all of that is coming with me into that study, um, really looking at, you know, what are the dynamics between even folks of color and what does that look like? What, how can that really help us to change the world? And I would say really coming from Coppin State, that's, that's what was instilled in me. It's really how to change the world. Um, and I just never thought I would ever think like that, ever. Um, but here I am thinking like that. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so excited to be here, and I'm thankful that uh, we have folks in the room so we can share our collective experiences and um, just be in, in fellowship with one another. Um, I'm Jarrell Johnson, uh, originally from upstate New York, but uh, born in, I'm mean, really raised in Atlanta, Georgia, um, so <laughs> that is home. <laughs> I hear that. Um, and also, uh, a proud graduate of the Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina, the home of SNCC, which is a student nonviolent coordinating. Um, Ella Baker, who is a fierce uh, civil rights leader, is an uh, alum of our institu a beloved institution, among, in, among, among others. And I'm just so proud to always carry that legacy of not just my institution, but the collective institutions that HBCUs, TCUs, HSIs, all of these institutions do to support, to love, to care, and be in community with so many folks, not just students, right? Like these are homes for folks who work professionally that work so tirelessly um, to do the work that they do. Um, and I am a fierce lover as well as a critiquer of HBCUs. Um, and so when I offer my love and I offer my critiques, I always center that by saying that it is coming from a place of genuine love. And you will hear some of that in my conversation today. But also I think that um, for me, it's important to always think about the populations of folk who are oftentimes not centered, right? All blackness at all HBCUs is not centered, right? Um, and we have to have that conversation. All blackness that enters uh, an intersection of gender and sexuality that colors outside the lines of heterosexuality and, and cisgenderism, right, uh, is not accepted and loved. All the folks who identify as Muslim at our institutions are not centered and loved, right? Those who hold disabilities and other forms of marginalized identities are not centered in these spaces. And I am a fierce lover of these institutions in that way. Um, and that reason, for that reason, I critique these institutions. Um, I come here from uh, previously having pursued my doctorate studies at Iowa State University. Um, that's another story about how I ended up in Iowa. But, um, but I, I, I found myself really um, secluded, right, trying to think about how I wanted to establish myself as a higher education scholar practitioner. Um, but I found that for me, it meant to return back to the place that started my higher education journey, and that is HBCUs, right? And that's why I centered my career around it. Um, and uh, I'm, going, I'm going to drag along this train of, of being um, not boastful, but humble about it too as well, um, that I also um, received the Spencer Dissertation Fellowship studying HBCUs, LGBTQIA issues. That has not happened since my my, my um, awarding, and I want that to happen. I want that to continue. Um, and so I'm working daily right now to make sure that our scholarship and the things that matter and the things that we need to discuss um, 
as, as we critique and love that our institutions are centered um, even above um, the, the perspectives of just centering uh, historically white institutions or HSIs or whoever else, because we oftentimes HBCUs get overlooked in the need to study. And so um, that's how I come to this work and that's how I come to these institutions. Um, and I look forward to further engaging with you all. Uh, good afternoon. I'm the other Dr. Johnson out here. <laughs> Very conveniently located. Um, but originally from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, uh, the home of more than 10 historically black colleges and universities. So I, I grew up in a state with a lot of HBCUs and that was just a conversation um, around me. Uh, I was fortunate enough to attend and graduate North Carolina A&T State University, the largest historically black college university in the nation. Um, <laughs> but, and I might have some socks on that represent my alma mater, I, just maybe. Um, you just ask me about the sock game later and I could have a bow tie in the backpack. We, but. I, I represent my institution very proudly. I am grateful for the opportunity to have attended there, and I, I really credit the foundation, the community, the all of the things that I think have been s expressed here uh, with the furtherance of my career, personally and professionally, uh, all started with also the gentle nudging of my parents, uh, but from an HBCU, the motivation to attend graduate school, the belief that I could attend graduate school, um, faculty who were engaged deeply in not only their own disciplines, but also my personal development. And I, I feel like these are through lines in terms of topics and, and themes that you will see and probably hear about you know, our institute, HBCUs and TC and other minority serving institutions as well in terms of this, this community building. It is not just an edifice for educational aspirations but also it's a people building place. And I, I think you'll probably hear more about that as you know, we engage in this dialogue that there's community and there's of course your return on investment when we start to talk about what's the, the impact of the students leaving these institutions and, and making uh, you know, impacts in their community, uh, jobs, but it, it all starts with developing the person. And I think that is something that is definitely needs to be addressed in terms of specific populations, but like the overarching theme that I, I believe that I've experienced is that personal development. Uh, and I've experienced HBCUs on, on two fronts, so as a student and as an employee. Uh, so after graduation, several years, I boomeranged back to, to Greensboro to work at a learning center, being an advisor, developing male retention programs, and I got to be a part of that caring personal development network I think that resonated with my experience more because I wasn't as attuned to it as a student. I was trying to do my student thing and, and just trying to and wear it where I could. Uh, there was a little culture shock for me going to a, an institution because I did see various types of blackness. Like there, it erased the one type of black experience. And so navigating that from very affluent to, you know, very low income to the middle, to students from rural, I mean, it was all there and that added you know, a rich texture to my developmental process. And then being able to work with those students on the other end, um, so it's, it's a fantastic experience and it definitely is a credit to where I have been and I will give them and the structures as much critique and praise in the same breath as possible because definitely we need more attention um, and not to overlook these really foundational institutions. Thank you. Um, there's some commonalities in what each of you shared in centering black indigenous identities and really finding that community and fellowship among your peers. And so um, if each of you can expand a little bit more on what are some of those challenges and barriers to access and student access where HBCUs and TCUs uh, bridge the gap and then um, how may they differ based on their respective historical contexts and um, student populations? We'll just circle back to uh, Dr. Buffer. I know that was a multifaceted question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Um, so one thing I wanted to start with the commonalities and um, Definitely, I think some of the important commonalities are um, the emphasis on community, um, on cultural humility, 
um, on culturally informed um, practices, education, when we think about curriculum, um, programs and services. So this spectrum from, you know, when we think about teaching um, to research to service that um, all of these aspects um, advising are all culturally informed. Um, and I think to a certain extent, very individualized, um, really thinking about the individualized needs um, of students. I, I think um, the histories of our institutions are of course very different. Um, when we think about historically black colleges and universities um, being born out of that legacy of slavery and the connection um, to um, land granting institutions, et cetera. Um, and when we think about tribal colleges and universities and some of the early infrastructure um, and supports that were, were put in place, whether that we agree um, or disagree they were adequate or not, um, these are certainly um, two different trajectories when we think about the history of how these institutions were developed. Um, also, historically, the other thing that, that really strikes me in terms of commonality is the, the um, history around oppression. Um, and when we think about the history of segregation, um, a lot of people don't understand that um, also indigenous people were also um, part of the legacy of segregation. And um, when I talk with folks who were like my parents' age, you know, they say that there were three different schools um, in their neighborhoods. There was a school for African Americans, there was a school for white students, and there were, a, were schools for um, indigenous uh, students. So a lot of people don't understand um, these different legacies um, and, and how they're connected. Uh, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for minority serving institutions to work together um, to think about common needs. I, I think particularly when we think about um, black and indigenous students, um, some of the, the social problems are very similar that our students are facing. Um, many students are low income. Um, many students are coming to the college experience maybe not wholly prepared in the same sorts of ways that other students are coming um, prepared. Um, so those are some of the things that I think our institutions really excel at in, in terms of taking students who may um, not have the background in writing or in math, et cetera, and working with these students and um, really making sure that they succeed, whether it's STEM, humanities, um, social sciences. Um, there's a lot of attention to um, just working with students and really understanding their needs and um, ensuring that they succeed um, in a lot of different ways, making sure that students don't fall. Um, and then the second part was the strengths and I, know I'm missing I think just in relation to the, the beginnings and the historical context specific to each student population. Okay, okay. But I think you've kind of explained okay. that too. All right, so I'll, I'll turn it over to some, <laughs> I'll turn, you I know, that was a letter professor question. give like a, a historical overview. I just wanna say that. It was a very good one though, okay. thank you. Um, so the one thing that I will add is that I think what's really common in the relationship between TCUs and HBCUs is you know, this enormous um, push during the civil rights era, right? For more control and more visibility and, and really vocalizing our need to have self-control over the way we want our education systems to be run. So I remember my parents talking about that era because they, were, they grew up in that period and seeing so few Native American students um, in historically white institutions. So there was, you know, of course, if you, I mean, you really have to take time to understand and appreciate the historical context to really know why these institutions exist and we just don't have time to run through that. But as we know, you know, there was really this, this push for land, you know, European settlers coming here and wanting to basically terminate Native people. Um, from that, there was sort of the assimilation movement where boarding schools 
entered the picture. So, you know, um, kill the Indian um, and save the man, so to speak. And so that whole era really shaped this notion of self-determination. So tribes were now going to take control of education. Tribes were gonna determine the future for the youth in terms of preserving language, preserving culture, preserving identity. And so in 1968, the first TCU was established on the Navajo Nation, Diné College. And since then, we've had the growth up to 37 TCUs across the nation, which you heard me reference earlier. Um, but this has impacted over 30,000 students who have come through the TCU um, system. And so there is this incredible movement now for that continued effort and growth of TCUs. Now, they used to be called tribal colleges, but they added on the university component because you know, there is now this push for not only to provide associate and technical degrees, but bachelor's degrees, master's, and now Navajo Technical University offering the first PhD in Navajo studies. Why do I start with this one? Um, I love everything that has been shared already. I, I think what I want to add is, let's really think about it. Um, in the context of the United States of America, um, indigenous people were a problem that needed to be exterminated. Black people or Africans were property, and um, whether it be by raping or um, by making sure two black people mate, um, they were for property. And when we think about it in these ways, it gives us another frame to really look at TCUs and HBCUs. Um, places that really treasure the people and while also acknowledging the history. Um, and one thing I will say, doing history at an HBCU is very different. I've, I went to a history class at Florida International, which is a, 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 um, a Hispanic serving institution, and history was even taught there very differently. Um, and it gave me a whole other appreciation because the way that HBCUs teach history, they do it in a way to still make you love all the people who are different from you for you to not hold grudges. And, and I'm like, how do you do that? Um, but I, I'm saying all of that because um, it really instills a sense of personhood and responsibility and agency over your body going to um, these, these institutions of higher education um, that may not necessarily translate um, to predominantly white institutions. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't happen um, at PWIs, but it is in a different sense. And so HBCUs and, and um, TCUs, I believe, have this very you know, distinct nature to them where you get to grow into those identities while still recognizing all of the history that has informed even their creation. Um, and I, I wanna go into more, but I think y'all did such a great job setting it up. You have, too, you so, have too many choices. I know, right? <laughs> I think I think the, the historical context is is it was well laid out, and I heard it in Dr. Gassman's uh, piece um, keynote today as well. But I also think that it's important to think about what happened after right black folks got free, um, and what happened even for me right as a young black boy in the in the educational system. Right, um, I found out in my first year on the tenure track that I have ADHD. Never knew that, right? But as I was going through the system, I was being labeled as deficient, right? Had all these different plans. And it took one black teacher in my middle school who said to me, you got something and I'm gonna make you do it, <laughs> right? And that sparked something for me. And so if it wasn't for him, I don't know that I would be where I am today because I was in my mind and in the conditions that I was navigating, 
right, even though I didn't know that I was navigating those conditions, was being told that I was not good enough to be, right, in advanced courses, to have an ability to be intellectual, right? Um, and all of that to say is that my story is not um, a singular experience. And there are black children, right, currently in our system today navigating that. So when they get to the level of having a higher education or having the opportunity to get to having higher education, and in some cases if, right, then it makes this thing of being at an HBCU even more special. To add to Dr. Hibane's point about the way that HBCUs do a great job, right? They don't always get it right, because they, they didn't tell me about the black queer folks that was, in, that was doing the things and, and getting the things together, right? But they do a good enough job that they instill in us this pride around being black and being in spaces where you don't have to hide, like, oh, I got to tuck my blackness away, right? Or having the surveillance around, oh, I need to present and be of the white gaze, of I have to appeal beyond, right, white folks. It was like, no, you black, own it, right? That was the experience that I got. I got the experience of learning that on my campus of Shaw University, there was a point where the library sits today where the Civil War ended. I didn't know that, right? I didn't get the opportunity to talk about that in grade school. It took me going to an HBCU to learn a lot of things about my blackness, right? When I was on campus, <laughs> I learned, right, about the systematic uh, failures of the society that keep us oppressed under domination, right? Which then, when I was in college, the Gina Six, I don't know if you all are familiar with that scenario, or what happened, but that was the first time I learned how to engage in civic engagement, to do protests, right? I learned about some of those pieces of my identity that I had not learned throughout the grade school system. And I think it's important as we think about our institutions not to see them as folks who've taken, right, folks who are not um, well prepared for these institutions. I think there's a shift that needs to be said that our educational system has fundamentally failed these students. Education has a debt to pay. This system has a debt to pay. In HBCUs, it's time that we start acknowledging the fact that HBCUs have been filling in the gap and standing there, and I'm trying not to get emotional because I don't want to get emotional, but they've been standing there, right, even in moments where they've been underfunded, Right, even when they know that sometimes budget might not make it because they don't have the students, even though we know that faculty show up and teach these students when they're not even getting a decent wage to live off of, right? We know that our student affairs professionals, some of us in this room are there, are those folks, right? not making enough money or do, getting their just due, right? They're still showing up. And it's time that this country honor that through fair funding, right? That we acknowledge the historical nature of where we sit and how we've had to deal and make do with what we have. I think about the words of the great goat that I always admire and I always, I saw her this past last summer and I thanked her, Dr. Dan, um, um, Dorothy Yancey Kozer, president, former president of Johnson C. Smith. And then she came to my great beloved institution and saved us from going under. And what she said one time when she testified in front of the U.S. Congress is that sometimes HBCUs we take too 
quarters, rub them together, and we do multiple loads of laundry. I'll celebrate that, but I'll also say, give us our things. In the words of Beyonce, give, us, give me my check or pay me in equity. <laughs> I'm not sure I'm supposed to follow that. <laughs> um, I, I think there's, there's so much truth uh, being told this afternoon and highlighting aspects of the historical context in which these institutions uh, were birthed. And what I find extremely interesting is that you know, while these institutions had this federal designation, some, the, the government had to label them right, for us to start classifying them as, as this type of thing. But they were doing amazing things well before the government noticed and said, oh, we need to classify you as 1890 institutions. Or, and, and so I think that is, that really speaks to the, the nature of the culture and the value that is placed on education as a gateway to empowerment, mobility, freedom, uh, when literacy was banned for you know and not even made available we found a way and then we made schools from one room schools to full-fledged buildings to campuses I mean the developmental process uh, throughout history is is a story of struggle uh, but also empowerment and I, I think that is a, a shared message between you know HBCUs and and TCUs of the growth and narrative that has happened where we said we need to find a way to educate our people. How do we do that? Okay, let's find a way. We might not even have two quarters. You know, we might be working with just this, the space in our living rooms, if we even have that. You know, what do, what do we do to make sure that our next generation is empowered and can move our society, our culture forward in a, in a productive way? And we continue to find that despite immense struggles and setbacks, and you spoke about the financial challenges, I've got some data that just makes your heart hurt about the underfunding of these institutions. And, and yet still, things, amazing things have happened, producing astronauts, scholars, politicians, amazing things are coming out of these institutions in spite of I would say inadequate resources. Um, and, and that's a testament to the, the desire and determination of those folks who work in those spaces because they see the value in the work that they're doing and the payoff down the line uh, for those who they're educating and supporting. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at the ta time and I'm like, Rodney, where's Rodney? You did not give us enough time. <laughs> but um, I, you know, from everyone's particip participation today, um, we have a really strong um, alumni association. And then if, if we can quickly share how important was mentorship um, and um, that relationship with your alumni associations and peers in you know, and seeing where you are um, in your roles and providing leadership opportunities. And I'm Dr. Bathford, sorry. Yeah. Um, so I'll just share a testimony um, of how I actually came here to the U. Um, one of my classmates at Howard was the former dean of the College of Social Work. And um, I was originally hired to do some consulting work um, here at the U. And I guess I did a good job because um, some of my now colleagues uh, approached the dean when a uh, position came available and said, like, please contact Tiffany and ask her to apply for this. And um, I'm glad I had come out here in advance because I think if we had had that conversation without me ever being here and like meeting people and um, seeing Utah, I would have probably just flat out just said no. Um, but I'm glad that like I had an open mind and said, okay, well, let me just, you know, think about this. And I ended up applying for the job and, you know, it was a competitive process and I 
um, got the job. So I was originally hired about five years ago as the director of the Master of Social Work program. Um, and I think I would have never gotten this opportunity or even known about the University of Utah um, had it not been for that connection. And so many times in my life, um, either through my professors at Howard or um, you know, other friends or colleagues that I knew from, you know, who were also alumni, um, just different opportunities to do research or for employment. It's just been um, such an important and uplifting part of my life. And um, I literally would not be here um, had it not been for another alumni um, who is also a Howard alum, obviously, but is not on this panel. So. <laughs> Thank you. Our TCUs um, have really strong alumni networks, and although I don't know the inner workings of, you know, how they, um, you know, bring in um, sort of that network to, um, you know, provide resources for the college, I will say that in my own observation, I have seen many graduates who will go through a TCU go on to a four-year institution, um, and then eventually on to graduate school. They will be the ones to then return and be the educators and the researchers that guide those institutions. And it was like what Mary Beth was saying earlier, you know, it's much easier for them to um, be in those positions than people from the outside who simply want to come and further a grant opportunity for their own self-interest. So I have seen that development really recently. Um, so we definitely need them as faculty. We need them as leadership of the institutions. But I've also noticed too that particularly for Diné College, you know, they've created sort of their own endowment. So anyone who has access to financial resources, who has that network, of connecting with people who may want to invest in TCUs. Um, you know, those are the folks that we're gonna rely on to, you know, bring those added resources in because as was said, many of these institutions are so underfunded. So again, it's relying on that expertise for those who have gone through these systems, um, but also to really, again, rely on their own networks as they pursued their own careers, um, and want to give back to community. So I love being an alum of Coppin State University. And um, I, I just joined a Forever um, Coppin Club. Um, so if you give it over a certain amount, you could become part of the Forever Club. Um, and I did that because a lot of people helped me get to where I am. And um, a lot of folks saw some things in me that sometimes I'm like, what are we all seeing in me? Um, but they really invested in me, their time, their resources. Um, and I would say that even right now, I give folks calls and I say, hey, there is this opportunity. Would you consider it? And that's because, you know, pe it w it's just that it's part of our culture. Um, it's not even like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to do this. No, it's, it's, it's literally part of the culture to really um, look out for folks and, and see where they are at, see if they're open to other opportunities. Um, and it has really just been because folks have invested in me and I've just, and, I, and that has been modeled for me. Um, I, I think I sometimes don't really see that often where it's actually, let me show you how to show up for someone. Um, being first generation, um, Yes, it's part of my culture in other ways, being from the Caribbean, but to actually, for someone to actually sit you down and, and say, this is how you do this, this is how you remain connected to your university, that was very, very powerful. Um, and so it's still something I do now, and I, I'm that person, that alum, and we all know those alums, when something is going wrong at the university, they make a call, <laughs> I am that alum. Um, and so I'm just very thankful because they, they keep taking my calls. <laughs> um, but you know, it, it is definitely, and I just even wanna take some time um, to honor one of my mentors, um, Dr. Mary Wanza, she passed away last year. And you know, 
she was just a tremendous impact on my, on my life. And I want to, you know, just say her name and um, give her her flowers, even though she's not with us. I send her flowers every wow. August, but give her her flowers and, and just say how thankful I am. So this question is very, uh, it's a very complex question, right? I think that times we think about alumni as this interconnected network that is only really there to help kind of think about what financial or what type of resources that we get from those connections. And it's funny because my partner is, a, is an alum of Florida, Florida A&M, um, and I always pick on them because they're very just like, like political and everybody's into something, right? Um, and then I took him to my um, alma mater this past October for homecoming. And I told him before we walked on campus, I said, I know you do your thing at FAMU and y'all are all into these networks and all of that. I said, but you come into a family reunion. Uh, so don't, don't bring that bougie stuff over here. <laughs> um, and I, I say that to say that um, there have been plenty of times where um, the connection, um, man, I think about the connection that a lot of my um, fellow alums and I have. We call each other on the phone, right? Um, we at the age where we in our mid something 30s, right? And all of us are going through different things, right? Had a friend call me the other week, going through a divorce, um, right? She didn't want to talk to nobody else, but she wanted to call me, right? Um, had another friend, right, who knows I do this work around LGBTQIA inclusion, who said, there's a current student on campus that um, is struggling with his sexuality. I want you to talk to him. And picked up the phone, right, called him. We had a conversation, right? Now we are in communication. It's that type of connection that I think we overlook sometimes of just showing up for our, our folk and really being there with each other even when things are good, my, my good best friend, right, just this week or a past couple of days ago, did the first, the second ever TED Talk on an HBCU campus at my alma mater, Shaw University, right? Called her up right before the, the, the session started and I said, I'm gonna lift you up, you're gonna do it, you're gonna kill it. She called me afterwards, we talked, we celebrated. It's those things that I, I'm a crybaby these days. Um, that I'm just so proud of, right? Um, this past October, I went back for the first time in probably like eight years to my homecoming. And I failed to mention this, but I am a proud member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. And, um, oh yeah, it's, it's right here. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and we lost a couple brothers. Um, who were younger, some I, I saw come through the House of Alpha, um, welcomed them in, and now they're no longer here. Um, it was a reminder for me to show up to this space a lot more. Um, you know, it was amazing to see us let our guard down and do what I'm doing right now, crying. <laughs> um, because we, we sometimes, that felt like a safe space for us. Like we didn't have to perform. Um, we all band together and made sure that, you know, his wife and children had what they needed, right? I still send his wife messages, make sure she's good, right? Um, she's also a Shaw alum. All of those connections and just being able to talk to each other and, and to check in with each other and um, rely on each other, even in times where we're happy and sad, going through something, that's invaluable. Um, and I couldn't trade it for nothing else in the world. I love, love. <sighs> the fact that we have these connections. Um, I'm gonna stop. <laughs> Yeah, I think I might add to that. Um, there's, and some aspect of the experience goes beyond words to where there is a, 
just a shared feeling that is, I almost want to say incomprehensible, right? You just, you, you feel the energy and it, it is, for me, I, I'm speaking on a, sp a perspective that is outside of institutional alumni networks. I mean, I, I, I connect with, with alum and they're, you know, my professors were really instrumental in me getting to the University of Georgia for a master's program, uh, but like we travel a lot. And so, you know, moving from North Carolina, working in Florida, went to school in Georgia, lived in Texas. And so we're, my family is, is, well, we're migrating west, it seems. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I have found comforting is in connecting with other HBCU alum. And there is just this unspoken connection because we have somewhat of a shared experience. It might not be exact, and we might even talk trash about each other's institutions, but we do it in such a way that is loving because as soon as someone else talks, then it's like, no, I, I can talk about my family, but you cannot. And, and there's this, this strange possession and, and ownership, um, but I have found that so comforting and uh, inviting to make that space that it, regardless, we have this universal experience of being a part of this type of an institution, wherever I go, whether it's a conference, I hear a Aggie Pride, I'm going in that direction, or you know, I hear a Howard alum, or there's so there's an HU and, and FAM, you know, it's there it is, <laughs> and and just to be in the circle, I talked for two hours at a conference with folks from FAM, and you know, I looked at my watch, it was two in the morning. Like we have different positions. I've never met the person but it's a gateway into that shared space, into that dialogue that that community affords us. And, you know, going back to like the impact of alumni, um, like alumni also has this advocacy role as well. And and you saw that with the, the tragedy that happened at Lincoln University with, you know, my former colleague, Dr. Uh, Bonnie Candia Bailey, and the Alumni Association being very, very vocal and critical of administration and the climate at the institution. So it's very versatile in where there's welcome and support on both ends and they will fight for, and we will fight for our institution as we've heard. Thank you all, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you sharing your experiences. Um, unfortunately, we are at the end of time, even over time, thank you Rodney. Um, but. I do want to encourage you to stay. Um, each of our alums will be uh, posted around at um, and hosting one of these round tables. So if you did have a pressing question or wanted to ask one of our panelists questions, um, you will have that opportunity in part two. So give, let's give our panelists a hand. Thank you. We just finished the session in the library. Yeah. 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 yeah, so we're not in a rush. Okay, and that's what I was just going to say. Is if you want to yeah, yeah. no, we're not ready rush. to go, feel good to yeah. go. Yeah. I'll let you know. We're not in a rush. Okay. okay. I'm going to just end up here. Okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Um, but yeah, uh, with Jure, I was, I was, I don't know if you were in my Iowa State program. Yeah. Uh, no, he said Iowa State. Iowa State. I yeah, but Ames. Yeah, because I've known a few folks who went to that program. Um, yeah, but I was uh, doing it. Yeah. Especially you, being with doing, 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 right, that's what I'm saying. I don't think anything. There's nobody in the country. There are only a couple of people in the country. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but most people don't. I mean, no, no. Because that's why I asked him. So oh, is it Morgan? Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's doing some work with him. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. That's what you were saying. Yeah. Drill's working with him. Yeah, I figured it. They're working on uh, 
some brand or something like that. Oh, they do some research. Yeah, he mentioned that. That's good. Yeah, because I asked him if he knew uh, Ray Winbishop and Morgan. Oh, yeah. You know Ray always yeah, say, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah. So he, it's so that's funny. They are working together. He mentioned mm -hmm. it, so that makes sense. Yeah. 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 He's still around there. I was, was up there. Mad. Yeah, he was. See, I knew him when he was down at Fitz. Oh, yeah. That's where I met him. Yeah. Over the race relations. Yeah. yeah. But then, I mean, I'm still like, Oh, yeah. It was too much. No, he wasn't. Yeah.